Well, thank you, praise team and Daniel. And um, of course, we really want to thank you moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, aunts and uncles, all those who are um, dedicated to bringing the kids here every week. We want it to be a, a great time of learning for them and we appreciate you making sure that they're here. Well, the papers are coming out and let me just apologize. When you look at it, you're going to think, I thought the rule was only use up 80% of the paper. That's typically what they do. Well, this one is from top to bottom, edge to edge, because this is one of those incredibly long chapters. And of course, you know, the chapter divisions are not part of the original uh, division of the scriptures. Uh, that was done relatively recently in the last several hundred years. And that was to make it easier so we could find the right chapters, the right pages together. So it's understandable why this chapter is so long because it's all a part of one story. And I think you're going to enjoy the story. All the way through the Old Testament and even into the New Testament, we find that the people are always being reminded of how their nation started and what God's plan is for them. Now the problem is the people of Israel are always forgetting their relationship with God. So that's a little bit of what we're looking at. But let's go back for just a, a little minute or two and think about what's happened. At a critical point in time, the people of God resisted the authority of God in their lives. And they had been given warning after warning by the prophets. You've got to change. I mean, it's important that you make decisions of obedience. But the people, because of their stubbornness, said, no, no, we want to do it our way. We want to worship our way. We don't want to be restricted by the demands of God. That's not the only way to worship God. And it wasn't long until the people were worshiping false gods. And God warned them time and time again. And when it got to the last time, the armies came in, destroyed the land, destroyed the temple, and the people of God, the Israelites, were taken out of the land for 70 years. Now it's been an incredible series of really miraculous decisions coming down from the king himself saying, listen, this is a prophecy, and though he may not have known it, he was fulfilling it, and he gave a, a, a permission for the people to go back into the land. And you can imagine how excited they must have been. But when they got back to Jerusalem, and they saw the walls were crumbled in a mess, the temple was absolutely unrecognizable except for a few stones of the foundation, they became discouraged. And it wasn't long until they were living regular life in this broken down city of God. In fact, they were even beginning to do the very things God had commanded them not to do that started the whole mess. They started marrying women from the neighboring tribes. They started drifting away from the truth that there is one God and there is one way to worship him. Nehemiah was in the king's court and he is stirred by what he's heard. I mean, he is burdened by it. And through a series of miraculous decisions again where it's obviously God providing the openings, he takes the treasures that the king has given and another large group of people and he goes back with the thought of reestablishing the temple. Everybody was against him, even his own people in many ways were against him, but with his determination and with the blessing of God, it's now 52 days later and the city is protected. The walls are up. 
The people are encouraged. They've already met one time and had a great revival meeting. But here we're told the people get together again. And that's where we're going to pick up our story. It's really a simple outline. It comes from a Bible teacher, Warren Wiersbe. Many of you might know him. He talks about in this chapter the greatness of God, the goodness of God, and the grace of God. So let's begin, and we're going to give a lot of our attention to what we find in the scriptures. Now, the only thing you'll see different is I've taken all those Jewish names of the individuals who were there, and I've put it in small print so I can skip those. And the reason for that is I would not say them the same way twice if I read it twice. I mean, I'm not very good at reading those Hebrew names. But let's look at the greatness of God. He is faithful and just to forgive us. What an incredible statement. Many of you say, oh, I know that comes from 1 John 1, 9, and indeed it does. And here we see again God's desire, his provisions that will allow us to be a part of his family and be blessed in that place. So let's look at the greatness of God. When the word of God speaks to us, we respond with prayer and praise. It's pretty safe to say that when a group, a church, or when individuals no longer praise the Lord, when they no longer are praying to the Lord, that there's probably some place in that recent past where they have quit reading God's word. And we see here, it says on October the 31st, the festivals of the, of the booths has already taken place. They've reinstituted the the festivals and the various holidays, but now the people want to get together again. So it says on October, 31st, on October the 31st, the people assembled again, and this time they fasted and dressed in burlap and sprinkled dust on their heads. Now that was an indication that they came there to repent. That's how they would dress. Those of, the Israel, those of Israelite descendants separated themselves from all foreigners as they confessed their own sins and the sins of their ancestors. They remained standing in place for three hours while the book of the law of the Lord their God was read aloud to them. Then for three more hours they confessed their sins and worshiped the Lord their God. The Levites stood on the stairway of the Levites and cried out to the Lord their God with loud voices. Then the leaders of the Levites called out to the people, Stand up and praise the Lord your God, for he lives from everlasting to everlasting. Then they prayed, May your glorious name be praised. May it be exalted above all blessing and praise. Whoa, let's plan a special meeting like that one. How many people will, will volunteer? Sign me up. I'll be there. We'll put a sheet on the back bulletin boards. First, we're all going to stand and listen to people read the word of God for three hours. And then after that, we're going to schedule no coffee, no snacks, Right after that, we're going to start and we're going to confess our sins and the sins of our ancestors for another three hours. I mean, none of us would sign up for that. Oh, maybe some of us would sign up just to see who would come so we could post it on Facebook. But really, can you imagine a meeting like that? And it wasn't one that was scheduled or, or programmed. I mean, it looks like the people were just so overwhelmed by the last time they spent reading, listening to the Word of God, and their time of, of, of being so burdened by what God had warned and promised that they said, we've got to get together again. We've got to do more of this. So here they are again, listening to the Word of God, and notice what happens. When they listen to the word of God, the natural, normal response is we begin with our conversation. We pray and then we praise the Lord. 
Our confession of sins enables us to see God's goodness and his glory. And when we see his goodness and his glory, it changes us. So here we have the people have been standing for all this time. And now their end result is this. For he lives from everlasting to everlasting. Then they prayed, may your glorious name be praised. May, be, may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. So that when the word of God speaks to us, we respond with prayer and praise. Let her be, the Lord created the universe. We know that. It's so important that we emphasize that. Now, we know that everything around us speaks a different word. And we don't claim to be able to answer all of the questions. None of us in here are scientists that, that enable us to, to answer all the questions. But the resources are everywhere. If you were here last week at the 1030 hour, you heard a very good message preached by Michael Passion and talking about the case for Christ. The evidence that backs up all that we've seen. And we know that part of the world we live in is that our young people are taught again and again that they're the end result of a long evolutionary process where it just keeps happening. And, and it's true, there are a lot of things we don't fully understand, but that position as well as our own position of special creation is based on certain presuppositions. This is our presupposition. We believe that there is a God who has, he's more than the sum total of all that we see in the universe. In regards to his goodness, his greatness, his complexity, his intelligence, he's more than the sum of everything we see. If we walked into a museum that was highlighting the, the artistry of a, of a particular individual and we saw 100 of his or her most famous works, when we got done, we would say, he or she is greater than those 100 works because they can make 100 more beautiful pieces of art. What we see in this world with all that it shows us indicates to us that God is much greater than the sum total of everything we see. But the world is teaching a different story. And it's very important, our curriculum for Sunday school emphasizes the biblical account of creation. When you hear any message coming from this pulpit, you will hear people support the biblical view of creation. Because if that's not true, then we're in trouble. And here's the good thing. The evidence, as it continues to come in, fits in perfectly with the account that God has given. The longer we go, the more we learn, the more we understand. There are many in the secular world who do not believe in the creation of the Bible, but they are now saying, well, it's obvious from the complexity that somebody organized this. And that's a growing movement even in the secular, the, the creation movement. It's uh, intelligent design is how you'll hear it described often. So here's the emphasis. He is a great God. And he made the skies and the heavens and all the stars. You made the earth and the seas and everything in them. You preserved them all and the angels of heaven worship you. The Lord created the universe and he cares for it. There are incredible shows now where you can see things that no one's ever seen before. Go to depths of the ocean where we've never been before. And we see all these creatures that have been hidden for thousands of years. And yet when we begin to look and see how they're designed and how they function in the environment that's created for them, we marvel that God has... He's done all of this. 
So these people are absolutely overwhelmed by this thought of the God that created the world. The God that takes care of everything in creation. He is the God that's involved in our lives. And this has stirred these people. The greatness of God. Let's look at the, excuse me, the goodness of God. And here's where he begins to tell the story. They go through and they, they give the entire summary of a story. And it is a great story. I think this is the best summary of Israel's uh, existence in the scriptures. So let me just read it to you. Starting at verse 7. God makes a nation. You are the Lord God who chose Abram and brought him from Ur of the Chaldeans and renamed him Abraham. When he had proved himself faithful, you made a covenant with him to give him and his descendants the land. And you have done what you promised for you are always true to your word. That deserves an amen, doesn't it? He is always true to his word. He keeps every promise that he makes. You saw the misery of our ancestors in Egypt, and you heard their cries from beside the Red Sea. You displayed miraculous signs and wonders against Pharaoh, his officials, and all his people, for you knew how arrogantly they were treating our ancestors. You have a glorious reputation that has never been forgotten. You divided the sea for your people so they could walk through on dry land. And then you hurled their enemies into the depths of the sea. You set, they sank like stones beneath the mighty waters. You led your ancestors by a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night so that they could find their way. You came down at Mount Sinai and spoke to them from heaven. You gave them regulations and instructions that were just and decrees and commands that were good. You instructed them concerning your holy Sabbath. And you commanded them through Moses, your servant, to obey all your commands, decrees, and instructions. You gave the bread from heaven when they were hungry and water from the rock when they were thirsty. You commanded them to go and take possession of the land you had sworn to give them. But our ancestors were proud and stubborn and they paid no attention to your commands. They refused to obey and did not remember the miracles you had done for them. <clears throat> Instead, they became stubborn and appointed a leader to take them back to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a God of forgiveness, gracious and merciful, slow to become angry and rich in unfailing love. You did not abandon them, even when they made an idol shaped like a calf and said, this is your God who brought you out of Egypt. They committed terrible blasphemies. Well, if you were like me and you were reading this for the first time with a yellow highlighter in your hand, you might have highlighted a number of phrases in there. This is so rich when it talks about how God interacts with us because we too are his people. Now it's true that we do not get to claim the promises given to Israel. But we too have been brought into a covenant with this great God of creation. We too have been brought into his family. So there are so many things in this that we can look at and say, yep, I understand it. That's right where I am. I understand that he is faithful, that he has kept every promise. I understand that his glorious reputation, the way the people of this earth view him is paramount. That's what is most important. I can identify with these people about a stubbornness in my own heart about this perceived understanding I have that says, oh, I know a better way than God's way. 
I won't do it God's way. I'll do it my way because my happiness is what is most important. And like these people, I too have found myself in very difficult circumstances only to be rescued by God once again. He formed a nation. Not only that, we see here that he leads the nation. <clears throat> But in your great mercy, you did not abandon them to die in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud led them forward by day, and the pillar of fire showed them the way through the night. You sent your good spirit to instruct them, and you did not stop giving them manna from heaven or water for their thirst. For forty years you sustained them in the wilderness, and they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, and their feet did not swell. Then you helped their ancestors conquer kingdoms and nations, and you placed your people in every corner of the land. They took over the land. You made their descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and brought them into the land you had promised to their ancestors. Here again, we see that God made a promise to Abraham. Your descendants will be greater than the number of sands, grains of sand, greater than the number of stars, simply meaning there'll be so many that you can't keep track of them, Abraham. Your, your, your family will grow and become a great nation. And I have made a promise and I will bring them into the land. And indeed, as we've reviewed the history so many times, God did that in a miraculous way. We are now able to see in our generation that Israel is once again in the land. Something that no historian could ever have predicted. How could these people, chased, killed, persecuted for nearly 2,000 years, how could they ever find their, themselves back in their land with their own identity, their own language, how could that have been preserved were it not for the incredible grace of God? So God led the nation in this day. He continues to lead that nation because those promises, that covenant, was an everlasting covenant. So here we go. God chastens the nation. Now this is the part of the story that the old people standing in the crowd could say, oh, I was there. I saw this with my own eyes. I have seen the work that God has done. I have experienced it. But many there were quickly forgetting God's gracious care. And in their stubbornness were becoming like their ancestors. Thus this great time of revival was necessary. Starting at verse 24. <coughs> Excuse me. They went in and took possession of the land. You subdued whole nations before them. Even the Canaanites who inhabited the land were powerless. Your people could deal with these nations and their kings as they pleased. Our ancestors captured and fort our ancestors captured fortified cities and fertile land. They took over houses full of good things with cisterns already dug and vineyards and olive groves and fruit trees in abundance. So they ate until they were full and grew fat and enjoyed themselves in all your blessings. Thinking about how those people came into the promised land. And here's where I marked it down. Because I thought, oh my, I am just like these people. Verse 26. But despite all this, they were disobedient and rebelled against you. They turned their backs on your law. They killed your prophets who warned you to return to you. They committed terrible blasphemies. You, so you handed them over to their enemies. You made them suffer. But in their time of trouble, they cried out to you. You heard them from heaven. In your great mercy, you sent them liberators who rescued them from their enemies. And you would think that would be enough. But that's not the history of Israel nor is it our history. 
Verse 28, but as soon as they were at peace, your people again committed evil in your sight, and once more you let their enemies conquer them. Yet whenever your people turn and cry to you again for help, you listen once more from heaven. In your wonderful mercy, you rescued them many times. Have you ever committed the same, son, the same sin so many times that you feel like, I cannot even go to the Lord and ask him to forgive me again? I've promised that this would never happen, and yet here I am again in the exact same place with the exact same misery. I mean, I knew it was going to come, but I, I chose to go my way, and, and I, you think, oh, God will never forgive me now. I mean, how many times can I use 1 John 1, 9? If I confess, he is faithful and just to forgive me. How many times will write here with his own people? The writer, Nehemiah, says, hey, listen. Every time the people cried, the Lord in heaven heard their cries and responded with great mercy. Verse 29, you warned them to return to your law, but they became proud and obstinate and disobeyed your commands. They did not follow your regulations by which people will find life if only they obey. They stubbornly turned their backs on you and refused to listen. Periodically, we will send letters out to people if they've missed church for an extended period of time. And it's not because we're worried about the numbers. Quite honestly, there are only about two or three of us that ever see the numbers and, and evaluate what they might mean. It's not that we're worried about whether or not uh, you're, you make us look good. The reason those letters go out is because right here, because there becomes a, a tendency on the part of the human heart to stubbornly turn away from the things of God and to begin to do things your own way because your own way is a better way. And yet God says, no, no, there's one way to live life and to see it really go the way you would like to see it go, not as a good luck charm, but as principles that will guide successful living, and that is to listen to and obey the word of God. So the people again say, oh, why didn't we learn it then? But they didn't. Let's look here. In your love, verse 30, in your love you were patient with them for many years. You sent your spirit who warned them through the prophets, but still they wouldn't listen. So again, you allowed the people of the land to conquer them. Now we look at the grace of God. But in your great mercy, again, the, that phrase shows up in this, this sermon that Nehemiah is writing down. And in your great mercy, you did not destroy them completely or abandon them forever. What a gracious and merciful God you are. And now our God, the great and mighty and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of unfailing love, do not let all the hardship we have suffered seem insignificant to you. Great trouble has come upon us and upon our kings and leaders and priests and prophets and ancestors, all of your people, from the days when the kings of Assyria first tri triumphed over us until now. Every time you punished us, you were being just. We have sinned greatly, and you gave us only what we deserved. How many times have you gone to a restaurant? Now, I'm guilty of this. Oh, I get in trouble. You'll see the picture in the, the menu. And when they bring it to you, it's not this big. It's only this big. And I don't do it nearly as much now as I used to, but I've embarrassed my wife so many times. I say, uh, is this what I ordered? Does this look like that? Oh, man, my wife, she'd 
Oh, you don't want to know what she told me. You would be shocked to hear the things she told me. So I don't do it now, but I still think it. I think. You call that a large ice cream cone. But being a real Christian I am, I give my wife the biggest one, if you believe that one. All right? But we know when we order something, we want what we've ordered. We deserve what's on the picture because that's what we ordered. Hey, listen, when you disobey God and when you turn and walk with, with stubbornness and rebellion in your heart, guess what? You get what you order. And that's what Nehemiah says. Hey, listen, Lord, every time we rebelled, you gave us exactly what we deserved. <laughs> So today, verse 36, so today we are slaves in the land of plenty that you gave our ancestors for their enjoyment. We are slaves here in this good land. The lush produce of this land piles up in the hands of kings whom you have set over us because of our sins. They have power over us and our livestock. We serve the, them at their pleasure, and we are in great misery. The people responded. In view of all this, we are making a solemn promise and putting it in writing. On this sealed document are the names of our leaders and Levites and priests. All of this comes to this incredibly important conclusion. The people said, this is the day I decide that I will serve the true God. It doesn't matter what's happened in the past. It doesn't matter how many people around me have disappointed me, who, who have who've dropped the ball and have discouraged me. No, right now, this day, I'm making a decision, much like Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It starts right now. That's what's happening with these people. They have been going through this process of revival, and now they've come to a point where they make the decision, I will follow the Lord. Well, you know, the obvious word of application is, where are you in this process? Because God does the same thing for you that he does for me. He patiently deals with us. He calls us back. He rearranges the circumstances to keep us from going that way or that way. And he brings us back to this narrow path where the goodness of God can be experienced. He says, this is what I want for you. I've closed with a little statement here from Charles Haddon Spurgeon, you might recognize the name, a great preacher of another generation. <clears throat> I read this and I thought, oh my, I have been exactly where he's writing. And that's where these people were. were. They felt like, I can't come back to the Lord. Look at how many times I've failed him. How many times I've disappointed him. I have no right to go back again, but look what it says. The more unworthy you feel yourself to be, the more evidence have you that nothing but unspeakable love could have led the Lord Jesus to save such a soul as yours. The worse you feel, the more it magnifies the grace and the glory of God. <clears throat> the more demerit you feel, the more clear is the display of the abounding love of God in having chosen you and called you and made you an heir of bliss. That's what these people experience. I can't believe that God will still do all this for me after I've disappointed him so many times. And the answer is yes, he will. So, Christian, where are you? Would you have been in this crowd standing for those three hours confessing your sin and signing the paper that said, 
I will serve the Lord starting right now. I trust that will be your commitment. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads, please? Father, we know that you work in our hearts. It's a private work that you do. Sometimes we'll see it displayed publicly. But typically, it's a private work that you do in our hearts. And Lord, I'm asking that those who are discouraged today would be encouraged by this testimony of your unfailing love, that you have made promises that you will never, ever forget or deny. And Father, as your children, we've experienced the best. So Lord, I'm asking that those who are discouraged would be encouraged by that great truth Lord, those who are stubborn and are, are beginning to walk in their own way and, and ignoring and even refusing to do what the word of God says, Father, I ask that you would bring revival to that heart in the same way you did with these people. And Lord, we know that when we live in obedience that the world sees you for who you really are that your reputation is lifted up and people can, can be drawn to you. So Lord, that's one of the reasons why it's so important that like these people, we live our Christian faith out loud. Father, this I ask for as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you. That was quite a lengthy chapter. I think you'll find that if you read it again to be a real note of encouragement. God bless you.